Hey everybody, Jay Young here from King Operating. If you will, go to kingoperating.com, our website, and learn more about the oil and gas business. Every Friday I do a newsletter and I do a video that will teach you something about the oil business. And if you want to know something about the oil business, send me a question and I'll go over those on our Friday newsletter. So kingoperating.com, learn more about our business and get involved. The Jay Young Show is a weekly podcast featuring insightful discussions with anyone from big business CEOs, celebrities, to military heroes. Each interview is a personal conversation about business, life, and anything in between. And now, your host, Jay Young. Hey everybody, thank you for coming today to the Jay Young Show. It's going to be a great program for you today. We're going to talk about business litigation, we're going to talk about uh, a lot of things, but go on YouTube, or I guess you're already on YouTube. And listen to the show, and go all the different media, and uh, and like us, and and that's where we are today. That's what we like. We want to learn more about people, and learn more about business, and learn more about how did you get to be where you are today. So, Lad Hurst, thank you for coming on the show today. I, I'm glad to be here. Thank, thank you, Jay. You. So, where did you grow up? How did you? Well, let's start from the beginning, kind of to just to. There's going to be some people out there that go, "Oh, should I be an attorney, or should I not be an attorney?" And what? What transpired there? And just kind of tell us about your background. Sure, thanks. Well, I grew up in St. Louis. Uh, go Blues. Oh. Uh, I, uh, I was there when I'm the Blues... I'm a Ranger fan, so <laughs> St. Louis is not a favorite. Uh, I, I was there when the Blues were formed. In fact, uh, I was friends with the first coach of the Blues. Uh, it was 1968. Wow. Yeah, went to a lot of Blues games when I was 10, 9, 11. And uh, the Blues played, actually, in the... Uh, Stanley Cup the first three years, 1968, 1969, and 1970, and then I had to wait 50 years for that to happen again (laughs) for them to play the same team that they lost to, the Boston Bruins. So uh, those of you who are sports fans know the Blues just won for the first time in their history the uh, Stanley Cup against the Bruins, so that was was exciting. Then I went to Mizzou down the street a little bit in Columbia, Missouri, and majored in journalism, uh, and then went to Cornell Law School. And uh, then moved from Cornell in Ithaca, New York, to Dallas, and I practiced my entire career in Dallas. I started with Haynes and Boone, a well-known firm, full-service law firm in Dallas. Although when I started in 1983, there were only 45 lawyers, and now Haynes and Boone, I think, is over 700, maybe even 800 lawyers now. Wow. So I left Haynes and Boone in uh, 2002. Why, why did you want to be a lawyer? What, what, what? Your journalism, then you go to law. What, what transpired there? What happened? Well, I had always wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, my mom had a view that our kid, our, her three kids had to have a, what she called marketable majors. So my sister was a teacher, my uh, brother was an accountant, and I was a journalist. But uh, that was a backup because I knew I wanted, from the time I watched a show called Judd for the Defense, mm. probably very few listeners are, um, have heard of that show, but uh, it was a show about a defense lawyer who... Um, sort of a, I guess, post Perry Mason type lawyer okay. who managed to get his clients off. And I just liked representing the little guy. And there was something that really appealed to me about that. So I always knew I wanted to be a trial lawyer. Okay. And, uh, and journalism was something, if I decided to change my mind, I could fall back on it. And I like writing. I've always liked writing. I've taught legal writing. Um, and, uh, and so it was just a natural fit to do journalism. And Mizzou was down the road in one of the top journalism schools in the country. What did you write in, in the High school and college. I wrote, I wrote on the school paper. I wrote on the school paper in high school and in uh, at college. I wrote on the school. The student newspaper is called the Man Eater because it's the Missouri Tigers. So oh, they, the Tigers go. are Man Eaters. So I wrote, yeah. wrote for the Man Eater. And then the the paper that you write on when you're in college is called the uh, Columbian. Um, so I wrote for that as well. Um, interestingly, this is um, so I was in college from 1976 to 1980. And it was a time when integration was still going on, and I covered the beat of schools, and I spent a lot of time talking about how schools are being integrated and what's working and what's not working in regard to integration. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things that I did um, when I was in uh, college. Okay, good. So then you got out, you went to, came to Dallas? I did right after law school. Haynes and Boone was in Dallas, so you came to Dallas, worked for Haynes and Boone. Uh, Yes, I clerked uh, in the summer of my law school, worked in Philadelphia, felt like a fish out of water, at a major law firm and, and uh, I had a girlfriend who'd moved to Dallas. I'd never been to Dallas before, but I fell in love with the city of Dallas, even though the uh, things didn't work out with the girlfriend, the things worked out with the, with the city, wow. came to Dallas in 1983 and, and then was practicing with Haynes and Boone for 20 years. So how long did it take you to, to so 76 to 80, you went to uh, College, right, and then 80 to 83. Soon? 80 to 83, it took you that long to become, to become a lawyer, is that what? It's what three was? years. Yeah, okay, All right. right, good. Then you're, then you're at Haynes and Boone, 
You lose the girlfriend, and then what happens? Well, I one of the reasons I came to Haynes and Boone or came to Dallas is I interviewed at other law firms <clears throat> around the country, and I wanted to try cases. And at that time, Haynes and Boone was forty-five lawyers, and I interviewed at a firm, for example, in. Chicago called Isham Lincoln and Beale. It was actually Abraham Lincoln's firm, mm -hmm. but they told me that I wouldn't try a case for five years in my in the first five years of my career. And I tried my first case um, at Haynes and Boone my first year as a non-jury, and then I tried my first jury case um, in my second year. So I wanted to get into court, and that was an opportunity in Dallas that I wouldn't have had other places: New York, Philadelphia, Chicago. It was much more entrepreneurial, if you will, from the legal perspective. You could get into court, you could try cases, and that's what I wanted to do. So that's why I came to well, Hanson. What What are some cases that you liked, or not specifics, or stuff? What is it? Well, I, or I'll t I try. Or? <laughs> no, all civil, or, uh, <laughs> civil cases. Oh, civil cases. Okay. Yeah. So no, one. Nothing to, to <laughs> read about in the well, National Enquirer or anything. Well, one of the cases I tried. Um, it's been about 10 years ago now, was at Haynes and Boone in, in 2009, and, and it falls into the business development area. So I represented, and this is all public record stuff, so I represented a gentleman who owned a 47% stake in the business. One other owner owned 53%. The company was worth over $200 million. My client was fired, and now he has an interest in a business that's worth well over $100 million, but he can't get it out. Mm. And the company at that time was sitting on about $150 million in cash. And he demanded that the majority owner distribute some of that cash. Majority owner refused. So we brought a lawsuit seeking to get a court ordered mandatory distribution, which we did. An $85 million court ordered distribution of which he would get 47%. Wow. wow. Unfortunately, that case was overturned on appeal. Oh, so, wow. you know, what they say about when the fat lady sings? Well, mm -hmm. um, all, we had an opportunity to settle. My client did not do that, so unfortunately. So that case uh, continued on. Ultimately, long after I was out, I understand there was a buyout, but that was a case where you had a situation which sort of led me to, it, it was in the uh, 10 years ago, in the midst of the practice that I have, business divorce, how do you avoid those situations? How do you avoid someone who is a minority owner who's stuck in a company and has no way out? You're holding an illiquid, unmarketable interest in a private company. So a lot of the talks and lectures I do now is developing a what I call a corporate prenup or an exit strategy so that you're not stuck in this position. Um, when the very first speech I ever gave on this topic was um, a, a play on Willie Nelson, and the, the speech was called, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grew up to be minority shareholders without a redemption agreement. Mm, <laughs> Long title, but the like point. It. But the point right. being is, you don't want to grow up holding something that you have no way to monetize. Right. Right. Okay. Good. In this one case, the two hundred million dollars forty-seven. Does this kind of make you think about it? Because man, you got your own website now. You're marketing yourself. You're doing. Is this the kind of the starting point of thinking about? Well, hey, let's let's try to get people to come in and get an agreement before. They go into a partnership. Well, I had been doing it for a number of years before that case, but that was the largest case that really got tried. Um, and I left Haynes and Moon then in uh, 2002. And um, it, it was a point at which I realized that this is not an efficient way <laughs> to resolve disputes. Right. And it costs a lot of money, as you can appreciate. It, it takes a lot of time. It's not what high net worth people want to be doing. And there's a, it's avoidable. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, it's a win-win. And that's what I spend most of my time doing now is how do you get to a win-win? Because these are successful companies. Mm -hmm. I call it the golden goose problem. The golden goose is laying lots of eggs, but the two parties are fighting over who gets the eggs. Right. So the question is, how do you do this in an equitable way? How do you structure something that's a win-win? Mm. And and the majority owner has a problem here as well. If, the, if you don't have a buy-sell agreement, if you don't have an exit strategy in place, you have a majority owner who's stuck with someone who they believe, the majority owner, because I represent majority owners half the time as well. My practice is roughly split between majority owners and minority owners. On the majority owner side, they're stuck with this minority owner who's not contributing, maybe not pulling his weight or her weight. They're not doing what they thought they were going to be doing, and you can't get rid of them mm -hmm. because you don't have a, a redemption right. Right. So a buy-sell gives either side the right to buy out the other's interest when they're not getting along. And you structure it with a trigger mechanism so it can be triggered by either side. You have a valuation piece because that's one of the things that, that you can expect 
owners of private companies to fight about the most is what is a private company worth? We know what a public company is worth because it's traded on a public exchange. And so if you hold an Apple stock, you go sell your stock in Apple. If you don't like the new iPhone, you can get out. Mm -hmm. But if you're holding a, an interest in a privately held business, there's no market for it. So right. the, the, the market for it is the other owners of the business. So you need to have a contractual remedy in place that will allow one side or the other to buy out. Okay. All right. So, so what you want to do now is, and, and how many people do that? How many people have gone to, I mean, I know they go to an attorney and think about documents and all this kind of stuff, but, but how thought out is the redemption piece or that, that piece in the very beginning? It's often, people, for, unfortunately, it's often forgotten. Yeah. Because, what, because entrepreneurs are focused on their business and forming a business or growing, if it's already formed, growing the business, they're not focused on who their partners are. And it's unfortunate, but it's, it's sort of a, um, an afterthought. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're focused on the business metrics. Is this technology scalable? Who are my competitors? What is my price point? What does my brand need to be? What is my marketing strategy? They're focused on a number of things that will drive success in the business, but they're not focused on who's their partner. And that, you, what I say to people is, you can overcome a bad product. You can overcome a faulty service. You cannot overcome a partner who's stabbing you in the back. Right. So they don't pay attention to it. I mean, and, and what I hear commonly is, well, I don't want to spend money on lawyers at the front end. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the horror story, I mean, there are lots of them, but one that I tend to give is I, I had an individual I represented at a university. And it may not be generally known, but universities make a ton of money from professors who develop technologies and then the university gets a license right. Mm -hmm. The university will not put in capital but they will get, because the professor is working there, they will get a license right. And so license fees pay hundreds of millions of dollars to universities across the country. Well, in this particular case, the university had a license right, the professor went out and got capital, but the person who was providing the capital didn't deliver. Mm -hmm. So the professor wants to get rid of the person who put in the capital. And I look at the documents and they're terrible. So I asked the professor, who drafted these documents? And he said, well, I wanted to save money, so I had the other side draft them. Mm. Wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, big, so, big mistake. Big mistake there, okay. <laughs> so the point is, is that you should be considering at the time you bring in new investors, getting a lawyer involved, and spending the money required to make sure that you have an exit strategy, you have a buy-sell agreement, you have a corporate prenup in place, it protects you, and it's, it's in your interest if you're the minority owner, it's in your interest if you're the majority owner. But so too often do they don't know, do it. But how do you know if... If that person that you're hiring is going to do what you, they they are they're supposed to be doing to get the business, like the forty seven percent guy. I mean, I could look at it and go, oh man, that guy's owed forty seven percent of the business, two hundred million dollars, forty seven, easy math, done. But then the fifty three percent guy goes, well, I know, but I did all the work. You took off, you know, three months a year, and when you were here, you weren't really here. You didn't do anything for the business, and and how do you? That that's the I guess the, the the big question is how do you, how do they you write down before you start the business everything that this person is going to do to earn their forty seven percent and how do you keep up with it? Well, another way of framing what you just said is that there's a difference in expectations. Okay, and it's sort of like you go into a marriage and you sort of expect what your spouse is going to do. Now, maybe you know, pick either side of it. I'm, I expect that I'm going to be doing. Are we going to share the chores equally? Are we going to share the child raising equally? Am I going to be the breadwinner? I mean, are those discussions that couples actually have? Probably not. Well, a lot of times in business partners, usually what you have is a division of expertise. Someone is good at marketing. Someone is good at the technology side. So you have the person who developed the product, but you have the person who's going to do the sales. Then maybe you have someone who's better on finance. So there's some expertise and they think, I, I'm weak on, on finance, I'll bring in somebody with more financial expertise. I'm weak on sales, I'm good on product development, I'll bring in somebody on sales. So there, you're bringing that person in, but that doesn't mean that person's going to work as hard as you. That person's going to share your same vision. So you don't know at the outset. That's why you protect yourself with an agreement that says if things do, if we don't have the shared expectations and if we don't want to continue to work together i have the opportunity to buy you out at a reasonable value mm -hmm. that's the way you protect yourself okay. because there's no way that you can know i mean the, another way of framing your question is i don't want a bad business partner how do i avoid getting a bad business partner well, one short answer is do some due diligence mm -hmm. too often people bring in a partner and they've not done anything to check on that person their background, not just a background check. They haven't talked about who else, what other companies have you worked at? And actually doing some due diligence, 
rare to be done. So they do no due diligence. They meet for a cup of coffee or they look at this person's work and they think that'll work. Right. And now they bring that person in and they have no redemption rights. So and that person turns out to be a terrible decision. I mean, I hear these stories all the time. I never should have hired this person, but they don't have the ability to change that. So you've got to have the ability to say, you know what, this didn't work and I need to now buy out your interest. Okay, okay. I mean, my, my recent blog post, we just uploaded it yesterday, um, it's called Winstead Business Divorce. And uh, as part of WinsteadBusinessDivorce.com, we have a blog. And the blog yesterday that we uploaded was on 50-50 partnerships. Terrible idea. We are, we are very strongly against 50-50 partnerships because they so often end in deadlock. Mm. And you can deadlock over all kinds of decisions. I'll tell you one story about that. So my brother-in-law is going to open an ice cream store with a, a yogurt store. In the is this e- true or is this? True story. Okay, okay. On the East Coast. He wouldn't mind me telling this. <clears throat> okay. And, and he's going to open this store and I t- with a partner, 50-50. And I tell him uh, it's a terrible idea. And he says, why? We agree. We're going to put in the same amount of money. And I said, because you're going to end up in a conflict. And he said, well, I don't think so. And I, I said, you really should pay a little bit more to get a 51%. That's called a control premium. Mm-hmm. And they were each going to put in $250,000 to start this, this store with remodeling and everything. And I said, you ought to pay them like another $25,000 to get that 2%. That's ridiculous. I'm not going to pay the 25%. So flash we're forward. We're friends. We like each other. We've it's, been friends it's all, for it's all gonna It's all going to work. Hell yeah. Well, it didn't work because they're on the East Coast. And I, and I said, you know, I don't know that I'd be buying a... a a uh, yogurt store on the East Coast because it's cold six months of the year and how much yogurt are people going to be eating in December and January and you know that's pretty much what happened they were barely breaking even and so now my brother-in-law wants to sell out the other guy says I'm happy he doesn't want to sell out so Mm. now my brother-in-law's stuck Mm. you you can't even get out of the business because it's not it's a 50-50 deal. It takes both parties to agree. Right. It right. took him two years to get finally convince the other owner to sell the business right. or buy his interest out. So, uh, so the blog post is about 50-50 owned partnerships. Bad idea. But what we've said you could do if, you're, if you want to have one other partner is you can structure it so that the finances and the ownership are different. What I mean by that is you can structure it so that each of you receive 50% of the financial returns. Mm-hmm. You're compensated the same, your distributions are the same, your bonuses are the same, but there's one owner who has a 51% ownership. Okay. So that avoids a deadlock situation. Okay. And then you want protections for the minority owner, the 49%, because that, because that owner could be fired as an at-will employee. So you could put in that that owner can only be fired if there's cause, because normally you, uh, an at-will employee can be fired with no cause. You're not required to show cause. So you want some protection so that the majority owner can't just fire the 49% owner unless there's actual cause. Right. Um, and you put in other protections like that. And then also, you obviously have a buy-sell agreement. So if they don't get along, one side or the other can buy, buy out the either's interest. Okay, okay. So, so Lad, when, when you said a minute ago the guy puts in $25,000 more for control, does he put that into the partnership? Does so... Is it two hundred fifty thousand bucks, and then he puts in one hundred and fifty, and the other guy puts in a hundred, or or does he give him twenty five grand personally, or how does it, it's the initial capital? Okay. In order to start a company, you're going to have to initial capital contributions, and so you would divide the capital contributions differently. So, let's assume that you need to buy space, you need to buy equipment, you need to hire employees. You're going to have to fund this either from an outside investment borrow the money or put the money in yourself and capitalize it out of your own pocket. And so it doesn't go to the other partner. It goes into the initial capital contribution okay. that each part are making. So if you need 250000 and one guy put in one hundred and fifty, and one guy put in a hundred, <clears throat> even though they could split everything 50-50 and be 50-50 partners, then at the end of the day, if one guy comes down in, in the midst of winter and says, hey, I got a buyer, the other guy didn't have anything to say about it. Correct. I mean, he's the sole deal, and then they split the profits. Correct, unless unless it gets a little more complicated, unless you have what are called super majority requirements, mm. and you can put in a super majority requirement to say that certain decisions take more than fifty, a, a bare majority take more than fifty one percent. So, for example, sale of the business that could take seventy percent. And so certain decisions will require both parties to agree. Okay. And and that's again has to be negotiated at the beginning. Right, right. When private equity firms make investments in companies, they will have even if they're make if they're making a minority investment, most private equity firms want control and require them to have more than fifty percent. But those that put in a minority stake in the company will often have super majority requirements to say, for example, you can't over lever, you can't take on more debt, 
and they would it would have to be with their permission before you borrow more money. Uh, new partners being brought in, they would have the right to vote on that. So there'd be some super majority protections um, in the agreement. Wow, and these are all questions that you've already done a couple of times. So you you have the list of questions that you want to make sure that both parties understand. And is it really expensive to do these kind of this kind of transaction? Well, I, I tease about it and I say, you know, if you're you mentioned earlier about a sole proprietorship. If you're doing a sole proprietorship, it's fine to go on to LegalZoom and use LegalZoom documents for whatever, a few hundred dollars. But once you bring in a partner, LegalZoom is not going to ask you the right questions, in my opinion. I'm not right. down on LegalZoom, but I've seen these sort of agreements before. And the problem is that you weren't asked the right questions. Mm. And if you're not asked the right questions, you, you can't give an answer. I'll give you another war story. So uh, another client of mine came in and was, uh, had formed the company already, and there are four partners. And they know what I do. And so my friend said, we want you to draft up a buy-sell. And my first question was, well, who do I represent? He said, what do you mean you represent? Who do you represent? You represent the four of us. I said, well, I can't do that. And he's like, are you kidding me? I don't want to uh, use curse words, but he said, do we have to get four lawyers? <laughs> and I said, no, you don't. What I can do is I can be hired by the company and draft an agreement for all four of you, but I can't represent any of the four of you, or I have to represent just one of you. Mm. Or I, or I have to represent two of you, but I, I mean, I can't represent all four of you because you have different interests. And he's a sophisticated guy and said, why can't you do that? And I said, well, do you think that if one of the four of you leaves the company early, you should get bought out? And he said, well, yes, but at a reduced value. And, and, it, and it depends on the time. And I said, right. you understand the nature of the issue is not everyone may agree with how things will go in terms of a buyout or what the valuation methodology will be. So once you bring in multiple partners, you need to have separate counsel or you need to have someone who drafts a generic agreement and then the four of you are gonna go need to work it out. But the lawyer's job is to, to get those questions out there. What if someone leaves? What is your valuation? What is the structure of the payment? Okay, we're gonna buy you out for, just pick a number, 500,000. Is the amount 500,000 paid up front? Is it paid over time? How many years? At what rate? I mean, you have to answer those kind of, how do you structure the buyout questions? When does the buyout take place? Sometimes you say, well, you can get a buyout, but you have to wait a certain number of years. Mm. Once you put your money in, you have to wait, and I know you're an oil and gas guy, there are times when you don't have a buyout right for some period of years, but then there is a redemption right that occurs. Maybe it's five years, seven years down the road, um, or you have to wait for a liquidity event. But those are things that you have to ask up front. Right, right, okay. God, there's so much, so much to go into this. So you could represent the corporate, the, the, corp, the, 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 the company, I guess, and then they have to go to their own people and say, hey, Am I, am I answering these questions right? Or is there any other questions I want to make sure I bring up? Because it, it does get sticky. Well, a lawyer can't represent both the owners and the investors. Right. That, that, that's going to be, there's going to be conflicts associated with that. Any more than a lawyer can represent a couple getting married and do a prenup, you're not going to represent both the husband and the wife. They're going to have to have separate counsels. The same thing. If you're having a shareholders agreement, you can't represent all shareholders because they're going to have different interests. Mm -hmm. the, the shareholder who's the majority shareholder is going to have a different interest than the minority shareholder. Let me give you an example of that. So on this buyout situation, so if you're the majority owner, you want a redemption right. You want the ability to say, things aren't working out, I want to buy you out. And the minority owner is going to say, okay, I'll give you that if you give me a right to get bought out. Mm so that I can trigger a buyout at some point down the road. But the minority owner should be saying, if he has a, or she has a lawyer, should be saying, well, if you buy me out on a Friday, I don't want you to sell the company for a much higher valuation on a Monday, Right. which happens. I've litigated those cases where someone gets bought out and a month later, the company is sold for a much higher price and how does that guy feel? Right. So what that minority owner should be looking for is what's called a look back provision. And mm. a look back provision can be negotiated the length of the time, oftentimes it's one year. Meaning if any transaction takes place after I'm redeemed, either you bring in a new owner at a higher price or you sell the company at a higher price, I get a stepped up valuation. So I get to look back for one year okay. after my sale to get more money if you do a transaction within that one year. It could be longer, but mm -hmm. that's something that again needs to be negotiated. <clears throat> right, right. Let me like, we're in the old business, right? So we understand prices can go from forty dollars to a hundred, and if you buy somebody out at forty bucks, and the price goes to a hundred, who would know that, right? So it, the the valuation can go straight up in value in in three months or six months or whatever. So 
what you're saying is a year is a good time. Is that it's normal? All, it's all nego- that's a normal. It's all negotiated. Okay. Now, the majority owner does not owe. If all information is disclosed, there's no obligation to give a look back. That's a negotiated ar- argument. But if you're the minority owner at the outset, at the big time you make your investment and you're giving a redemption right, before you know anything, you want to say, look, if you do redeem me, I want some protection. Right. Okay. Just because I want to be sure that I'm not treated unfairly. Yeah. But if the minority owner doesn't get a look back right and they're bought out and three months later the company sells, they don't generally have a claim unless there's some material information that was withheld that wasn't disclosed. So the guy knew he was going to sell it. Correct. You know, way before. He had a purchase contract in his back pocket and had been offered it. There's, then there's a problem. Yeah. But, it, but if something new came up, you know, that's just too bad, so sad. So right. the minority owner needs to have a lawyer making sure that those questions are being asked. Right, right. So what are some and of the let, big... And let me just mention also yeah. another issue is valuation. I told you it's a big fight. And particularly, in, I do work also in family law. I'm not a family law lawyer, but family law lawyers bring me in to help do a business divorce inside the family marital proceeding when, they're, when the couple owns an interest in a private company. And valuation is a big issue. I tend to joke and say, on the golf course, the valuation is really high. Mm -hmm. In the divorce court, it's really (laughs) low, okay? Now, maybe that's because I tend to represent the wife in the side of these things, and I see the husband taking high valuations to his friends and low valuations in the divorce court. But it's also- You're a good golfer. You're a good (laughs) golfer, so you try to play golf. (laughs) It's also true in the the, uh, non-family law space. Valuation's a big fight, big issue. Why? Well, part of it is discounts. So when you value a, a minority held interest in a private company, it's subject to discounts for lack of marketability and lack of control. And those discounts can be 40 to 60%. Mm. So let's put some numbers on it. I own 30% of a company that's worth $10 million. You would think I would get bought out at $3 million for my 30% interest. But if I'm subject to a 40% discount, then you take my 3 million and you discount it by 40% because there's lack of marketability and lack of control associated with the minority held interest. That needs to be in your agreement. When there's a buyout or a, or a uh, buy-sell agreement, are we using minority discounts? Do they apply or do they not apply? That's how the minority owner needs to be protected in terms of the valuation methodology. Otherwise, the majority owner is going to be saying, well, sure, I'll buy you out at your 30%, but it's going to be subject to minority discounts. Okay, and the minority discounts are negotiated up front? Well, they're, they're determined by a valuation expert, but whether they apply or not, is okay. going to be determined up front in your agreement. I see. You need to tell the because the valuation expert will say, "Do I apply minority discounts or not? Are they app, and here's what they are if they apply." And right. then he'll he'll say, "Well, it's a legal issue whether they apply or not." Yeah. And so that you want to make sure if you're in the minority side, you're protected. Mm-hmm. Right. Because most businesses that are worth ten million bucks, and they're thirty percent, they rarely have three million dollars or ten million dollars in the bank. Correct. Just ready to give out. So. Well, most buyouts do not pay money up front. Right. When you're bought out, it's almost always over a period of time, okay. which is negotiated. And then and then you have negotiated of, well, at what interest rate? Is it's three-year buyout, four-year buyout, five-year buyout? How much is paid up front? All of that's in the agreement. Okay. Okay. So the majority of your divorces, you said that you you handle the wife's side. Correct. So they, they evaluate it really low, obviously, and then you have to negotiate that. Well, uh, in, the divorce, the in the divorce court... The number one thing that couples fight about, leaving aside anything to do with custody or children or anything like that on the business side, the number one thing they fight about is valuation. Mm -hmm. So one thing you can do, so the the typical problem in a marital situation is the company is worth a lot, 20 million, 30 million, 40 million, but the couple doesn't have enough money in their marital estate for one to buy out the other. There just isn't half of that money outside of that business. So if the business is worth 40 million, neither side has $20 million outside of the business to buy out these other, the other's interest in the company. So how are you going to handle that? Well, one is you can do a long-term buyout. It could be five years or 10 years that one or the other is buying out their interest. Or you could, because the, the party that's running the company generally wants to have the equity pass at the time of the divorce. They don't want to leave their spouse as an owner in the business, mm-hmm. typically. But if they don't have the cash to pay for that spouse's interest, they're not necessarily able to require that. So the one thing we have done in a several instances is, is what we call a kick the can down the road strategy. In that strategy, the spouse who's going to be selling retains her interest 
in the company for three to five years. And at the end of that three to five year period, there's what's called a put call. It's an option each side has. The husband has the right to call, meaning I'm now going to buy your interest. And she has a right to say, I'm done holding my interest, I'm putting it to you. So you essentially, you're kicking the can down the road and giving the husband, if he's the owner, it could be the other way, obviously, but you're giving the party who's controlling the company three to five years to go find the money to buy out the other spouse. Okay. And right. during that three to five year period, the spouse who's continuing to be an owner will continue to receive distributions, continue to have taxes paid, because these are usually passed through entities, will have taxes paid, and then there are protections or restrictions on the operator, if it's the husband, the op husband operator's ability to pay himself bonuses, to give himself distributions, to bring in uh, new, new investors or new owners. Those are called negative covenants. And we put in a series of restrictions on the, on the person who's the operator. Again, in my experience, typically the husband. Um, we put in restrictions. And then, of course, there's a concern about, there's a lack of trust between these couple getting a divorce. We have a lot of transparency. There have to be annual audits by an outside auditor. The, the wife uh, will have accountants who will have access to online accounts, can't manipulate accounts, but can monitor what's going on in the accounts and regular reporting. So mm -hmm. you create a transparent structure during that holding period. Right. Well, that's a lot. That's a lot of information. Well, you guys are involved throughout the whole process and, and continue on, I'm sure, throughout that until the person's paid off. Well, we were talking before the show today, and, and a lot of what I do is getting to a win-win. I mean, this is about, in a, in, a, in a litigation matter, it's a zero-sum game. <clears throat> There's a winner and a loser. But in a divorce, we know what's going to happen. There's going to be a division of the assets, and it's supposed to be an equitable division in Texas. It's a community property state. It's supposed to be equally divided. So we know what the outcome's gonna be. So it's how do you get to a win-win? Mm. And I call it optimizing, optimizing the value of divorce. Divorce shouldn't be a liquidation scenario. It should be an optimization scenario. Now, again, they're not happy, usually when they're getting a divorce, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't optimize the value of the estate that's in the marital estate. So my job, I view it as, even though I'm representing one party, is how can I get to a win-win that's, that's a good deal for both sides. Okay. And how does that work with, uh, so if I if I'd say, hey, okay, so my business is worth 40 million bucks, I owe you 20 million, I'll pay you out in five years, and I'll sell the business for 100 million. In three years, what happens then? Does, does my wife get, ex-wife get 50% or does she get her 20 million? That's a great question. It's negotiated. Negotiated, okay. The options are, first of all, if the business is sold and there's a five-year payout, she's gonna get paid right away, obviously. Or 20 million. Right. Okay. So you'd, you'd, you'd have an acceleration clause. Right. If the business is sold, the amount owed to her is accelerated. Your question deals with, does she get any more than the 20 million? Right. Well, that's negotiated. I, on the wife's side, always try to get that. And the arguments will go like this. The husband will say, well, why should I pay her any more than the 20 million? I'm doing all the work. Mm -hmm. My answer to that is yes, but you have her capital tied up. So it's not fair for her to get no increase on that. But because you are doing most of the work, we would ask for 50% of the increase in value. Okay. So that protects the wife. So she gets some increase over the 20 million. If the, if the company sells for that. Of course, the other thing the husband will say is, well, what if it goes lower, right? Mm -hmm. And my answer is, well, you wouldn't be selling the company if it was going lower, because right. that wouldn't be a, an economic thing to do. So we will try to negotiate to get a increase or a step up right. in value during the period if the business is sold during the period of the five years. What if it goes bankrupt? I mean, what if it just goes in the toilet? Then both sides are hosed. <laughs> <laughs> you can't pay the twenty million. You can't pay the twenty million. Right? You know, so yeah. Well, I mean, that's a good question. I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer. The the bankruptcy question is: Is a note out of a divorce dischargeable in bankruptcy? I don't know that it would be dischargeable. I'd okay. have to. I you need a bankruptcy lawyer to say. Yeah. Fortunately, the couples I've been involved with, no one has had that situation. So I don't know if a a, a payment note would be dischargeable in bankruptcy. Okay. All right. Great. Great. So. What would you do different in your lifetime if you went back and said, would you start earlier with this business divorce with Winstead, the business divorce? Actually, no, I do something completely different. I, I like entrepreneurs. Okay. I like the entrepreneurial spirit. I have two daughters who are now both in college, both involved in business and looking at being business consultants or something in that area. And I, I like working with entrepreneurs. Okay. I like their creativity. I like their can-do attitude. Um, that's why I think I do what I do is I'm trying to help them 
deal with the problems that they have in their business. And I think I would go into business as opposed to going into law. I enjoy the law and I think I've provided a value to my clients, but I enjoy actually the operations and the growing and the excitement of being part of a team. And the really successful entrepreneurs, I mean, I know there are some that are sort of solo and have a reputation of being individualists, but the ones that I see are successful are great building teams. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they don't take all the credit, they share the credit, and they elevate their entire team. And those are the ones that, that I would like to see um, celebrated more than some of the individual who write books about it, um, because I think that, that they're the people you want to work with. Okay. Anything in particular that you listened to in college or, or um, anything you've you learned early on in your life to become the man? What, what, what do you tell your daughters? Do you tell your daughters anything, anything in particular that uh, you'd like to share with Well, I, I think the most important thing in life is character. Mm. And what I tell my daughters is it's not about money and it's not about um, where you start. It's about how you treat people on the way. And if you treat people the right way and you respect other people and treat people the golden rule, the way you need to be treated and, and really try and make a difference in the world. I mean, part of this is a spiritual belief. So I'm Jewish and I believe that we are here and we should be trying to make the world a better place. It's called Tikkun Olam, to make the world better. And it's not your job to finish it, but nor can you shirk from the task of making it better. So if you exercise character and you, you focus on trying to make the world a better place than where you found it, life's gonna be pretty good. Okay, good, very good. So do you think it's, it's growing up and getting where you are today, do you think it's who you know? Do you think it's what you know? What you do with it? What, how, would you, how would you count that percentage-wise? I don't know if I can put a percentage on it. It definitely helps to know the right people. And my daughters are talking with me now, they're learning about networking. Mm -hmm. They never had learned networking until they got into college. And, they, and I've told them how important it is that you build a strong network. Uh, but So know who you know is very important, uh, but that only gets you so far. And you've got to deliver once you, as I say, who you know may get the door open. But whether the door slams on you or not is about your ability to deliver. So I think knowing people helps open doors, mm -hmm. but the door's not going to stay open if you don't deliver once the door's open. Okay. So it's, the, then it's what you know and what you do with it and how you present yourself and with character. Okay, good. Anything, what, what do you do uh, for fun? Uh, well, I, I, I tease because I was a journalism major, as you asked me you know, a little while ago, and I feel like I have one good book in me. I haven't written it yet, okay. but I read a lot. Okay. And I, what and do you I, read? All kinds of things. Um, I've started, I didn't used to read um, uh, biographies, but now I've started reading biographies. I'm reading one on Einstein, which I feel is really good. I've read Hamilton. Um, and then saw the musical. Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, I saw the musical. Then I read <laughs> the Ron, oh, wow. Ron Chernow's book. Um, so I read more. So I read um, biographies now more than I used to. But I also love um, thriller fiction. So there's and I like character driven thriller fiction. So like Gabriel alone is um, Daniel De Silva's character in a and he's a uh, Israeli agent. And I think. Uh, Daniel Silva has written 16 or 17 of these books now mm. and his new one comes out next month in July I think it's either number 17 or number 18 I've read all of them mm, so okay. I mean it's it's I feel like I I you know that I've grown up with him <laughs> and then I and, and when Harry Potter came out I read all seven Harry Potter books to, oh, wow. my, to my oldest daughter out loud wow yeah that's awesome yeah so that's awesome. I'm a big Harry Potter fan those are big those are big books <laughs> it took a long time it did take but a I long. also read um, um, To Kill a Mockingbird to her as well, out loud. So it's different to read that book out loud. And then we watch the movie together. Wow. Yeah. So how long did it take you to read To Kill a Mockingbird? Out loud? Did, did you do it? Did you do it at every night? night? Every night before she go to bed. Right. An hour? Oh, no, minutes, no. I want her to go minutes. to bed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would say. Couldn't sleep way before that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I would say 15 to 20 minutes a night. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. All right, good. Yeah. Good. So To Kill a Mockingbird, good. What about, um, what we like, what, do you like a favorite vacation? Do you like Well, I, I, I like biking, and my brother-in-law um, convinced me to sign up this year to do the Hotter Than Hell in Wichita Falls. Oh, wow. And uh, I've never ridden a century. I did a long bike ride in 2016 that was about 440 miles. We were riding about 60 miles a day, but I've never done 100, and not in the heat of Wichita Falls either. So I know there's a lot of people, I don't know how, who listen to the show, but there's people who've done it. <laughs> 
And uh, my brother-in-law said, don't worry, they can give you an IV on the way. And I said, Jeff, if, if I need an IV, I think that's a sign that I need to stop. But, I, <laughs> but I'm trying to get back into to biking. So I've, done a, I've started doing a bunch more uh, back on the bike. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. Okay, great. Well, hey, we need to wrap up the show today. I really appreciate you being on. Winstead, Ladhurst, and talking about, you know, business divorce. So I thought first this was about, this was about divorce or something, but it's about business divorce. But you, you want people to come to you before they start the business and get involved and they're going to build At these- the time of the business formation or when investments are made, uh, it, I mean, it doesn't have to be at, at company formation, but when you're investing in a business or you're growing your business and you're taking a new investment, you need to structure the investment in a way to make sure there's an exit strategy. Right. And we write about business issues on our blog, again, at winsteadbusinessdivorce.com, about a variety of these issues. We talk about buy-sell on there. We talk about 50-50 owned companies, uh, what makes companies successful. It's really driven by owners and investors in private companies. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I think it's great what you do. I mean, I think it's great, great idea that you did, entrepreneur. I mean, you, are, you are definitely the entrepreneur with this and starting this business and starting this this type of brand because you know you can be a lawyer you can be and i say lawyer you said lawyer is that a, is that okay if i say <laughs> well, that i got a friend of mine that says counsel law, law, counsel counsel there you go <laughs> be a counselor you could you could you know sit there and wait for the phone to ring and be a whatever but you've come out there yourself and started this website you've done all the things necessary to get this thing started and you spoke to a couple of groups that i'm associated with tiger 21 and you know and, and i think it's great that you're doing this because it really does help entrepreneurs and people you know that are minority owners as well get what they deserve in the business if they help build that business up it helps protect them as well so i think it's great thank you very much for coming on thanks and for having me hope you hope to have you on again soon i appreciate it thank, thank you. you very much